As we have seen so far, Turkish history has surprisingly often been shaped by empires, whose dynasties were descended from one of the 24 tribes that migrated to Anatolia from the Aral Sea. These include the Seljuks, who brought about the Turkish emigration, and of course the Ottomans, who cemented Turkish claims to rule over Anatolia and added expansion into Africa and Europe. But between these great dynasties lie many more stories. One of the most famous and yet most mysterious stories is that of the Akkoyunlu. When the Ottomans were still a regional power, these Turkmen initially ruled only a small principality near Diyarbakir. But under the leadership of Uzun Hasan, the Akkoyunlu expanded massively. By the end of the 15th century, the Akkoyunlu Empire stretched from the Caucasus to Iraq and from Anatolia to Iran. Unlike the Ottomans, these Turkmen maintained excellent relations with the Empire of Trebizond, and Uzun Hasan was descended from the Komnenes dynasty on his mother's side. Another distinctive feature was Uzun Hasan's paternal affiliation with the Bayunder, one of the most important tribes of the Oguz Yabga Federation. However, unlike the Seljuks and Ottomans, the Akkoyunlu were not only proud of their blue blood, but also saw it as their duty, after centuries of emigration, to protect the legacy of Bayandar Khan, legendary ruler of the Oguz state. This brought Uzun Hasan into direct confrontation with Mehmet, the conqueror of Constantinople. After the invasion of the Seljuks in the former Byzantine Empire, many of the Turkish Oghuz tribes are known to have migrated to Anatolia. And after the Mongol invasions ended, numerous smaller principalities had formed in the 14th century, which we know as Anatolian Beyliks. Like Erdogrul and his son Osman, both founders of the Ottoman dynasty, families descended from one of the 24 Oghuz tribes ruled almost everywhere in Anatolia and some of them made no secret of their origins. On the contrary, some Bays saw themselves not only as lords over a piece of Anatolian land, but also as heirs and representatives of their respective tribal ancestors. But besides the Beyliks discussed so far, there were other Turkic dynasties that ruled further east and are at least as important for our understanding of Turkish history. Their influence came to light only at the time when the power of the Beyliks was already on the wane. Those principalities were the Akkoyunlu and the Karakoyunlu, two states with similar names. Translated, they read those with white sheep and those with black sheep. This naming, as with the Gokturks or the White Huns, can be classified as metaphorical in nature. Whether the Akkoyunlu and Karakoyunlu were closely related, however, is not known. Interestingly, their histories do build on each other. Of these two states, that of the Akkoyunlu was the most powerful, although the Karakoyunlu were the first to rise to empire, as we have seen. Officially, the story of those with the white sheep begins in the 1340s. The Beyliks of Anatolia had just declared their independence, and the Mongol Empire of the Ilkhanids had a firm grip on everything to the east. Byzantine chronicles tell of a certain Tur Ali, who lived near the settlement of Baybert in eastern Anatolia at that time. He is also described as the Lord of the Turks of Amid, Amid being the ancient name for Dyer Bakir. He was also a high-ranking politician, who was in the service of Ilkhan Mahmud Ghazan, a descendant of Genghis Khan. Tur Ali's foreign policy gave his family great influence within two decades, thanks in no small part to raids into Mesopotamia and Syria. But the collapse of the Ilkhanids had created a power vacuum in the region, and so the Akkoyunlu were constantly at war with other tribal federations. Particularly striking was the attitude of these Turkmen toward Trebizond. In 1348 they stood for the first time at the gates of the Black Sea city. Emperor Alexios relied on diplomacy. He married his sister to Tur Ali's son Kutlu, so that an early peace began. Much more important, however, is the fact that the Turkmen Panchen dynasty of the Akkoyunlu thus gained momentum. For under Kutlu, many more marriages were made between the Pontus Greeks with Byzantine pretensions and the Turkmen. 
In that period, the Ak Koyunla dwelled in an area between Baybert, Shivas and Dyer Bakir. Theoretically, they ruled over a territory of about 35,000 square kilometers. Although they were sedentary, they had to keep moving around as a result of disputes with the surrounding principalities. Their rule was therefore not yet consolidated. It was only under the presidency of Kara Udman Beg that a period of stability began. Kara Udman, or Kara Osman, was a notorious army leader. Even until he was 80 years old, he personally led the Turkmen into every Majur battle. But he was also a skilled strategist. After Kara Udman ascended the throne of the Ak Koyunlu, who are also referred to as such in the chronicles at the latest, he was confronted with a number of potential enemies. First and foremost, the Ottomans, who had swallowed up almost all of Beylik's Anatolia, and had also expanded into the Balkans. To make matters worse, a warlord named Timur had attempted to emulate the Mongols from deepest Central Asia, and ruled everything east of the Euphrates. Even parts of Anatolia were under his control for a short time. Kara Udman saw his chance. He offered himself personally to Timur to overthrow the Kara Koyanla his rivals from the throne in Karabakh. As a reward, he received full control of Dyer Bakir, and then took part in the Great Battle of Ankara, 1402, against the Ottomans. As a result of this crushing defeat, many Baliks declared their independence from the Ottomans, including the Karamanids. However, Timur died only three years later, and immediately the support for Kara Udman's policies within his dynasty fell. Turbulent times followed in the Ak Koyanla state. Kara Udman was forced to come up with something. He saw an opportunity to consolidate his rule on the one hand, and to strengthen his state against the Ottomans on the other. Conquest campaigns alone were not enough. The Lord of the Turkmen made contact with the Holy Roman Empire in Germany. The majority of the Ak Koyunlu were Sunni Muslims. However, their ties with the Orthodox Christian Komnens of Trebizond show that the rifts along religious cultural lines may not have been as great as they might appear. On the contrary, under Kara Udman, Christian locals, regardless of their ethnicity, were allowed to participate in the political and economic branches of the state. Kara Udman, after all, was himself of half Pontic descent, and while his personal faith may have been Islamic, he was not averse to those of other faiths. It is not surprising that he sent ambassadors to Europe to find allies against the resurgent Ottoman Empire. From 1412 on, according to German chronicles, Kara Udman was in constant contact with the German king Sigismund. After conquering land in Syria and Mesopotamia in the 1420s, he became increasingly attractive as an ally of the German king and other European states against the Ottomans. Sigismund awarded him the honorary title of Perinceps Mesopotami et Imperator Tartarorum from afar. According to a chronicle by Giorgio Dolphins, Kara Udman even managed to drive out Venetian garrisons along Syrian coastal towns by mere rumors of his terrors. In 1430 31, he planned a joint attack with Shah Rakh, a Timurid, against the Ottomans. But for political reasons, a Majur attack never materialized. Nevertheless, throughout the years, the German king and the Turkmen prince worked closely together on a geopolitical level. They carried out secret missions and economic missions together as far as the Volga and even Central Asia. From then on, the Ak Koyunlu also maintained relations with Poland, Moldova and Hungary. European rulers saw the Ottomans as a threat to the Christian West the latest after the Battle of Nicopolis, now Edirne. The mobilization of the Turkmen of the Ak Koyunla Federation was therefore an opportunity for the Holy Roman Empire and the states in Eastern Europe to encircle the Ottomans geopolitically. 
The Europeans were obviously aware of the difference between the Ottomans and the Akkoyunlu, as the Akkoyunlu were called Turkmen and not Turks. But who were the Turkmen actually? Basically, Turkmen became a substitute word for Oghuz and referred to those Turkic peoples who had left the Oghuz Federation and moved west from the Aral Sea. This means that practically all Turkic tribes, federations and kingdoms listed here are considered Turkmen, i.e. the Seljuks, Ottomans and just the Akkoyunlu. Turkmen in this video does not mean the inhabitants of today's Turkmenistan, whose political history goes back to the 15th century, but all Turks who emigrated from that area before. We speak of a federation in the case of the Akkoyunlu because in practice the state was a collection of different tribes, as is so often the case with Turkmen principalities. However, three tribes formed the upper caste in the state, the Masilu, who were actually called Maslu, the Pernak and the Bayander. The rulers of the Akkoyunlu came from the Bayander clan, arguably one of the leading tribes in the Oga state. In the listing of Oghuz tribes, the Bayander are listed as the first tribe within the Gokan caste. Now, Gokan was the son of Oghuz Kagan, the legendary founder or leader of the eponymous federation. Together with two other castes, they formed the Yukuk group, meaning three arrows. The Kinnik, the Seljuk tribe, was also part of the Bozok. Opposite to this was the Bozok group, the Grey Arpus, who were again divided into three castes. The K, Bayat and Afshar are among the most important of these tribes. However, a peculiarity of the Bayander is that, unlike the other Oghuz tribes, they joined the Oghuz state later. It is historically proven that the Bayander clan was once part of the Kaimek Federation, that is, part of the state that ruled in the immediate neighborhood of the Oghuz. Only one other Oghuz tribe had also been part of the Kaimek, the Pechenek, who ruled large parts of Ukraine in the High Middle Ages. While the Pechenek had left the Federation early and turned against the Oghuz, the Bayander probably rose to one of the most powerful clans in that very period. An indication of this is the account of the Oghuz Federation in the book by Didi Korkut, one of the national epics of the Turkish Oghuz peoples of Turkey, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan. In it, a man named Bayander Khan is described as the chairman of the federation. He was the Khan of Khans, so basically king of kings, and thus the unchallenged leader of the state. One of the main characters in the story, Salur Khan, is his designated successor, and unlike Bayander, plays an active role in the epic as a heroic figure. It is quite possible that Bayander and Salur Khan were meant to symbolically extol the eponymous tribes within the Oghuz. However, Didi Korkut's book was most likely written at a time when the Bayander of the Akkoyanla state, roughly speaking, did not have much to say. In any case, centuries after their emigration and after they had gradually consolidated their power in eastern Anatolia thanks to Kara Udman, the Bayander recalled this origin. Therefore, the state of the Akkoyanla was called Devlet Bayanderia, state of the Bayander, in the local sources. And indeed, as with the Ottomans, there is a dynastic chronicle published in 1470 that is said to prove the connection between the family of Tur Ali, Kara Udman, and their descendants to the Bayander tribe. The extent to which even Prophet Noah was one of the direct ancestors of Kara Udman is not to be evaluated here. The chronicle obviously served to legitimize the Akkoyanla rule. However, the epic of Didi Korkut and the self-representation of the Bayander family show that the leaders of the Akkoyanlu were not only proud of their origin, but also saw themselves as the leaders of all Oghuz Turks. Not all Turkmen in the area saw it that way. Kara Udman died in 1435, when his young rival Kara Iskender knocked him off his horse in battle and killed him. This was followed by a particularly dark period in Turkmen history. While the Kara Koyanla rose to become the rulers of the Caucasus and western Iran, the Ak Koyanla state was plagued by struggles for the throne. However, in 1453, just as Mehmet was conquering Constantinople, Kara Udman's grandson ascended the Turkmen throne. 
Unlike his father, this young prince was able to calm the tribes in the state, unite his family behind him, and quickly raise a large army of fighting men to oppose any outside threat. It was time to turn a duchy into an empire. And no one was more up to the task than Uzun Hassan.